This is George Lucas. I was the executive producer of The Empire Strikes Back and developed the story for this part of the saga. This was the first time I was able to put the number of the episode on the film and the actual title where it belonged. When we did A New Hope, the studio wouldn't let me put that on there because they felt it was too confusing for the public. This is the second chapter and it's the middle of the first trilogy. Therefore, it actually has a lot of uh, challenges that the first chapter and the third chapter don't have, which is there's no beginning and no end. And lots of blizzards, it was very, very cold. Uh, it was very challenging on lots of levels. This was also when we tried to move into the land of stop motion animation. We'd done a little bit of it in the first film. And in this film, I was able to take it to being a principal character with the Tauntauns. Mark at the end of New Hope had been in a car accident and I knew that uh, Mark was going to look a little bit different than he did in the first film, but my feeling was that there's some time has passed. They've been in the rebellion, they've been fighting, that sort of thing, so the change was justifiable. As the story turned out, there's a scene to be in the film when Mark gets beat up by the monster, which helps even more. But that really wasn't the main emphasis of why we wrote the monster in the beginning. It was just we needed something to kind of keep the film suspenseful at the beginning while the Empire is finding them. Kirsch wanted to take the film in a slightly more serious tone than what I had done on the first film, but without taking it completely out of the Saturday matinee, you know, fun kind of film that the first film had been. Uh, he just wanted to get a little deeper into the characters and make the jokes a little less flippant, which I think we managed to do without making it less fun than the first one. I think Kirsch was able to bring in a lot more character with the droids and Chewbacca, make them integral characters and not allow them to get pushed aside. The first film centered on the droids, so it was very easy on this film to have the droids disappear, and one of the challenges was to keep them sort of front and center, even though the story isn't told from their point of view like it was in the first film. Well, Star Wars isn't sci-fi at all, it's a space opera, which is a subgenre. I mean, it's sort of halfway between science fiction and fantasy. The motif I used to tell these stories was the Saturday matinee serial, which is a, a particular genre that was very popular in the 30s and 40s. I wanted to look just like that, and those were, at least the Flash Gordon, Buck Rogers kind of things, were space operas. Some people like to call them comic book stories, but they aren't comic book in the superhero genre. They're comic book in the very early part of the century, when adventure serials first started. We had a number of problems with shooting the snow monster. We could never quite get the suit to work right, and so we kind of made it so it was very vague, and it wasn't until later that we were able to create a, a good monster suit that was more realistic looking and bring the creature in here a little bit more to the forefront so that it was more threatening and more interesting. I think one of Kirsch's other challenges was to create a little bit more emotion in Chewbacca. I think that was accomplished in a great way with his sadness over Han Solo being missing. I'll say one thing for the actors in this film, they all look very cold because they really were very cold. One of the great difficulties of doing the special effects on this particular snow planet is we were doing white objects on a white background, which had really never been done before in terms of matting. And so it was very hard to hide the matte lines. Wow. We were very conscious of the fact that we didn't want to drag this thing down into a dark morass that was significantly tonally different than the other film, but we wanted to be more sophisticated and deal with the fact that the film is going in a darker direction. So the kind of goofy giddiness of the first film was toned down dramatically on this film and it was replaced with a kind of a slightly more mature humor. I had the sequel rights that I had gotten almost by accident on the first film because I got them because I wanted to make sure I could finish these other movies thinking that I was going to have to struggle to get them made. And I didn't want them to have the right to say no. But as it turned out, they became extremely popular, so the problem became just the opposite, which is they wanted to take it over and make it their way. And I wanted to make it my way. So the struggle became one of who was going to control the picture as much as anything else. We were very concerned because it was a darker story. And I was very concerned, especially at the end of the story, where the hero loses and has this stunning revelation about his father and also has his hand cut off. It's a pretty down ending and not at all like the ending for the first film, but it is the second chapter and that's the way it was. I mean, that's, I had to do that in order to get to the third chapter. In a lot of ways, I think it hangs together better.
Uh, we did have the advantage of having been through it once, and this is our second attempt at refining how everything goes together. And the first film was extremely experimental in terms of just how we went about making the movie in terms of special effects and production values. And, and I was really under a lot of stress from the studio and everybody and had very, very little money to work with. I had about half the budget that this was. Ultimately, it was even less than that. The Walkers, if anything, were inspired by the original novel of War of the Worlds, where the Martians walked on like giant spiders. They walked on legs. I was trying to come up with a way of making this battle different and unusual without putting tanks and normal military stuff in there and came up with the idea of giant walking machines. They're tall because I wanted the speeders to be able to fly under them, you know, to make a more dynamic kind of battle out of it. And again, I was struggling with the fact that in the first film I had this big space battle at the end of the movie, but in this film there wasn't anything like that. One fortunate thing about Star Wars is I've always been able to pretty much tell the story without any interference. Even the first one, the studio, Alan Ladd Jr. was very cooperative in allowing me to do what I wanted. But since the first film, there had been a sort of continuing change of management through the rest of the movies. You know, you don't always have a guarantee just because you have a good relationship with the studio at one point that two or three years later, you'll still have that relationship. Fortunately, I was able to be immune from that kind of corporate turnover. Because this film was not a traditional sequel, it was just a continuation of a story. And because it didn't have a beginning and an end, it had a unique structure where a lot of the big action sequences are early on in the movie and it ends on a personal note. These are things I'm not sure a studio would have gone along with if they had their say about what was gonna happen and what was not gonna happen. I didn't have to put pressure on Kirsch. I think there was a lot of pressure on him to say, I want this to be the best movie it could possibly be. You know, I don't want to drop the ball on the franchise. I don't want to not make this better than the first film. One of the things I wanted to do was to begin to progress the love story, but I couldn't really resolve it until the third film. It's the progression of a love story that never goes anywhere in this particular movie. In the end, he confesses his love for her and that sort of thing, but it isn't when we get to the next movie that they're madly in love or it sort of resolves itself in any way. It's just a... It's a very subtle movement of the emotional relationship they have. And that's always been a difficult thing in this particular story because the, the love story is a very thin factor in all of these. Subtle in the first film, move along on a very thin note on the second film, and a very slight resolution in the third film. Mostly Saturday Night Night Serials had no love story at all. They, the love story was, you know, a hero meets heroine and they fall in love. I mean, there's no dialogue or anything. It's just, it's sort of a given. Oh, you're the hero? Yeah, I'm the heroine. Oh, okay, let's kiss. <laughs> you know, there, there was no real depth to it at all. And uh, the, not much time was ever spent on the love story aspects of it. The thing about Dagobah was that in the original story that came out of New Hope, at this point in the story, Obi-Wan Kenobi counseled Luke on how to become a Jedi and the nature of the Force and to really learn about the Force. But because of the situation in New Hope, I decided that there wasn't very much for Obi-Wan Kenobi to do in the last part of the picture, and I felt it would be more dramatic to kill him off, and that I would then figure out what to do in the next movie when I got there. So here I was in the next movie, in this section, the middle part of the section where Luke learns to use the Force from a Jedi, who was supposed to be Obi-Wan, and I'd killed him off, so I couldn't do that anymore. So I invented this new Jedi, Yoda. And in order to sustain what I figured was going to be a lot of long, talky scenes, I wanted to make him a rather unique alien character. So he was fun to watch. And because he was supposedly one of the greatest Jedi of all time, I wanted to make him very small and very un-Jedi looking so that it would be a real surprise when you discovered that this funny little frog-like creature on the side of the road, so to speak, turns out to be this great Jedi Master. But it really came out of the problem I had in killing off Obi-Wan Kenobi in the first movie. Not technically killing him off, but having him join the Force at will. <laughs> the issue of consciously joining the Force, which is a theme that runs through these films, and being able to retain your personality, your individuality, 
once you've gone over to the other side is part of the story that gets explained in the first three films. And here it becomes kind of a mystery because it's never really explained how and why that happens. It was very important in this movie at this point for us to realize that Darth Vader was a human being, that he wasn't a robot, he wasn't some kind of monster, he wasn't an alien. Because in the first film, you didn't know what he was, you never saw him. After going through that with Kirsch, he came up really with this thing of having him put his helmet on, which was really nothing more than a setup for the next movie. The classic mythological motif that goes through a lot of stories through history is that the key mystical character is an animal by the side of the road that seems very insignificant that when the hero comes past he's kind to where most people pass that creature by they ignore him or they belittle him or cast aspersions upon him the hero is kind to him and by being kind to him the hero gets the magic that the character on the side of the road has and in this case i was playing that motif more literally than i had in the first film it's kind of what obi-wan kenobi is in the first film as the old wizard but here it's much more the magical frog so to speak there was a huge challenge with this i didn't want yoda to look like a man in a suit so i made him two and a half feet tall which is would have been impossible you know to put anybody in and in england we had worked across the street from itv which is where jim henson's group was and we knew jim henson and so i asked jim if he thought it would be possible if we could get together and create a very realistic looking puppet and make it work and he thought about it and he thought it was an exciting idea and he thought it might work and so he helped advise us on this and he recommended that frank oz be the puppeteer he said he's really the best so between the jim henson and myself and frank oz and stuart freeborn and kirshner moved around to create something that seemed completely impossible and when i first came up with the idea of a two foot high jedi it was the, one of the scarier things in the movie because if he looked like Kermit, we would have been dead. And we were just terrified that he was going to be this sort of shocking new character. He didn't know how we did it. And I think when it first came out, that is, was the impression. That people just couldn't figure out how we created this character. But it was struggling with this character that took me to the next level of saying, gosh, I wish I could get that character to walk because he can't walk more than a few feet because you know, he's really a guy on a hand and moving around. It takes a lot of work to get him to go anywhere. That was really what started me on the idea of creating digital characters that could actually move freely in a set without having to have the whole scene blocked around the puppeteer. I always liked the moment in this scene where an asteroid hits one of the Star Destroyers, and then when we go to the briefing with Darth Vader, one of the guys gets killed. The image flickers off. The Nazis are, you know, basically the same costumes that we used in the first film. And they're designed to be very authoritarian and very military, very empire-like. You'll see as time goes on, they don't really appear in the movie about the Republic, which is the first three movies. You don't have that same kind of militaristic look because in the first three films, the Jedi are the ones who keep peace in the universe, not the military. All these scenes with Yoda are written around the puppet. So they're staged around the puppet in the little house, in places where we could actually cope with the technicalities of how you do these scenes. And I wanted them to be a little bit of variety because they all take place in one part of one planet. By having inside, outside, uh, in confined spaces and not moving around too much, we were able to deal with the puppet. And Kirsch did a great job with this. I mean, he had a real connection with Yoda. And one of the reasons Yoda works as well as he does in this is because Kirsch believed him so much and believed in what he was saying and, and believed in him as a character. So he didn't just slough him off and you know give up or think of him ever as a puppet. One of the more fun aspects of his character is that he starts out as this funny little creature and then he turns into this wise old Jedi and he does it in this scene. He's goofy in the beginning and then he just turns and you can see him go from being wacky to being very wise. Frank Oz did a brilliant job of acting in this picture. We tried actually to get him a Academy Award nomination and Screen Actors Guild said puppeteers aren't actors, which I thought was outrageous. A lot of acting started out as puppets and puppeteers in the old days, you know, a few thousand years ago, before the Screen Actors Guild. But it's a great, brilliant performance, and it's acting. It's the best of acting. This scene in the snake's mouth 
worked better on the page, I think, than it finally turned out. It's a very hard concept to pull off. I mean, I think it works, but I'd always expected it would get a laugh when, you know, the ship flies out of the creature's mouth. But as it turns out, most people are astonished <laughs> and slightly confused, I think. We never really got the reaction we were looking for at the end of this scene. It, it was based on a mo mythological motif, but as we put it together and everything, and I, as, as I wrote it, it, I thought it was really funny. You know, the revelation of it. We never quite got that revelation to be as humorous to the audience as it was to me when I first wrote it. <laughs> Every once in a while when you're writing, you come up with an idea and you write it down and you laugh to yourself. That's what happened to me when I wrote this scene, but it doesn't translate as I'd expected. But... Oh, I was torn with revealing what was going on before it happened, but then the film itself takes its own life and it kind of demands that you do it in a particular way. I just wouldn't work if the story isn't told in a way that you could reveal that before it actually happens. Because the film isn't about the snake, and actually the, even the scenes in here aren't about the snake. The scenes are really about Han Solo and Leia, and they're more love scenes and getting to be intimate scenes than they are where they are and what their jeopardy is. This scene is another example of what do you do when you got a puppet and you can't move around, and he can't run or walk or anything. We came up with the idea of putting him in a backpack so they could be carried around. Now with digital technology, we'd probably just have him bouncing along next to him. In a film like Star Wars, to have maybe 10 minutes of the film be lecturing, explaining the Force, how it works, the nature of the dark side. And there's a lot of sort of philosophical bent in these Dagobah scenes and a bit of nervousness on everybody's part that this would play and not put people to sleep. But I think part of it is having a unique alien character that's fascinating, having a performance by Frank Oz that is believable and sincere. It makes the, the middle of this movie relatively soft next to what people expected of the second film in Star Wars. At the time, we had no way of knowing whether it was going to work or not because it was very unsequel like the risk I had was that I put the action adventure up front to say, okay, here's the action adventure part. But from now on, it's more going to be a personal film, you know, where people are being philosophical and worrying about emotional issues. Part of the going into the tree is learning about the force, learning the fact that the force is within you. And at the same time, you create your own bad vibes. So if you think badly about things or you act badly or you bring fear into a situation, you're going to have to defend yourself or you're going to have to suffer the consequences of that. In this particular case, he takes his sword and with him, which means he's going to have combat. If he didn't, he wouldn't. He is creating this situation in his mind because on a larger level, what caused Darth Vader to become Darth Vader is the same thing that makes Luke bring that sword in with him. And so just as later on we find out that Darth Vader is actually his father, so he is part of himself, but he has the capacity to become Darth Vader simply by using the hate and fear and using weapons as opposed to using compassion and caring and kindness. But that's the big danger of the series is that he will become Darth Vader. In this film, when it first came out, nobody knew that. Nobody knew that that was even part of the plot. And even when you find out that in this particular film that he's his father, you don't quite get what is really at stake, except the metaphor that he could become his own worst enemy. It works as a sort of philosophical metaphor, but it also is a plot point. It was fun being able to introduce these bounty hunters into the series and some of the original stories and original struggling with the screenplays that the bounty hunters played a more important role and they pretty much got written out of A New Hope. So it was fun to be able to get them back into this film. You know, they became the critical plot point with Han Solo and it had been set up in New Hope with the Jabba the Hutt scene, but I was never really able to continue that story. Boba Fett is popular because he's mysterious and he's powerful and he's very much like the man with no name from the Sergio Leone Westerns. Again, the challenge in the Dagobah scenes is to try to explain as much as I could about the Force without it getting completely didactic and boring. But there are certain 
aspects to the Force that need to define what a Jedi can do that the other characters can't do. And these scenes are really set up to do that, to say, what is the Force? How does it work? What are the powers that the Force has? This particular scene is one of my favorites. Ultimately, I guess it comes down to the power of positive thinking or your belief system. If you believe in something, then it will work. If you don't, it won't. And part of getting something done in your life is to believe that you can do it. A lot of the scenes, again, are very old in nature and common wisdom told in all kinds of stories. And one of them is believe in yourself and believe in what you're doing. People use to pass on this kind of information to the younger generation. Frank's got a lot of long dialogue scenes, you know, a lot of preaching and lecturing and He's able to pull it off with a certain amount of panache and character that makes it very, very watchable. It's hard to believe when you're starting into something, and it happens in a lot of movies. Whenever you make a movie, you're always looking at parts of the movie and saying, is this going to be believable? Can you pull this off? Or is the audience just going to laugh and say, this is silly? Because you really don't know. You're taking on a huge challenge. I mean, you know it has a very large chance of not working. When you leap out there, especially with something like Yoda, yeah, you know, and I did it in the first film with centering the film around the droids, about having a, a co-pilot who's a large dog. I mean, it's just everything. Are people ready for this kind of fantasy or will they just not go with it? There's just no way to know it when you're working on something like this about whether it is going to have that necessary suspension of disbelief or whether you're not going to get that far. And you're using the medium in every way that you possibly can to make this become believable. But in the end, I had to have a little green guy who could act and could perform. It took every bit of energy, creative energy we could muster to make Yoda happen. It becomes a bit of a humorous bit, only with Piet here, who managed to survive the whole thing. At the end, and at the very end, he expects to get zapped too, but he doesn't. I have to keep reminding people that Darth Vader is evil because ultimately he becomes sympathetic, sort of, especially in the next film. And he didn't want to lose contact with his evilness. And the easiest way to do that was to kill anybody in sight. The concepts, the motifs, and the themes in the first three movies of this trilogy, I've also tried to use in the episodes one, two, and three in different ways, so that they're kind of harking back to something you've already seen or the way I'm telling a story it'll reverse itself which is you'll see something that Boba Fett's father will do that you'll then end up seeing Boba Fett do here in this junk scene so I've gotten a lot of places in the movie where you see a scene that's extremely similar in the first trilogy that's in the second trilogy and what it does is sort of set you up for the event in the second trilogy even though I'm doing it in the reverse what I call sort of reprises of ideas. It's like a, a, a musical theme that keeps repeating itself over and over again in different ways. I've used that as a technique throughout all six movies. And even in between some of these movies, I will repeat things and have some, an actor sort of confront or a different character confront the same situation or have the same moral quandary and then watch how he comes through it as opposed to the way another character would. It's pivotal, Luke doesn't have patience. He doesn't want to finish his training. And he's being succumbed by his emotional feelings for his friends, rather than the practical feelings of, I've got to get this job done before I can actually save them. I can't save them, really. But he sort of takes the easy route and the arrogant route and the emotional but least practical route, which is to say, well, I'm just going to go off and do this without thinking too much. And the result is that he fails. It doesn't do well for Han Solo or himself. It's the motif that needs to be in the picture, but it's one of those things that just in terms of storytelling was very risky because, you know, basically he screws up and everything turns bad. And it's because of that decision that Luke made on the planet to say, I know I'm not ready, but I'm gonna go anyway. I came up with the idea of a cloud city as I was flying. I spent a lot of time flying airplanes and flying above the clouds and I thought, it would be pretty if you had a gaseous planet like Venus, where it's just a gas planet, but that all the cities just sort of float in the clouds of gas. Lando Calrissian was created as a character who was a foil to Han, who represents what Han was before he met Luke and Leia in episode four. One is a representation of Han at the beginning of his transformation, 
and this is him sort of halfway through, he is sort of making the same mistakes that Han would make if Han hadn't joined the rebellion and become a little bit more compassionate. He's the more out for himself kind of character who has to do what's practical to keep his life in order. And now Han is trapped in a world between those two. You know, he's not quite as compassionate and caring as Luke and Leia are, but he's moved away from where he was, which is where Lando Calrissian is now. This scene here is again stressing the fact that Luke is making a critical mistake in his life of going after to try to save his friends when he's not ready. There's a lot of being taught here about patience and about waiting for the right moment in time to do whatever you're going to do. And it ends with Obi-Wan and Yoda kind of feeling not good about Luke's mistake. And they were pinning a lot of hope on Luke. It sets up the fact that in this series, Luke could be expendable at this point. That maybe he's made his bad choice and he's going to go off and something bad is going to happen to him. And therefore, the idea that there is another possibility here, we don't need Luke to tell the story. We can get somebody else to do it. It's really designed to sort of make you feel that Luke is expendable. The problem with one of these kind of movies is like Superman or anything else, but if you've got a hero who can't be killed, then where's your drama? Well, here, what I've done is said, well, this guy can be killed. Don't worry, he's not the important one. There is another. It's a cheap trick, but it works. Some things that are designed for the next movie, some things that come out of things from earlier movies that nobody's ever even contemplated yet in terms of the fact that there would be three movies that came ahead of this. All the seeds have been planted in these movies in little moments, little lines, and things that hopefully when one sees all six together will resonate back and forth between all the movies and reveal things. The idea of 3PO being disassembled and then trying to get himself put back together again is a motif that is carried through with Luke and also even with Han. It's a motif of the movies. In this case, it's physical. It's a physical manifestation, but in the rest of it, it's either emotional manifestation or a personality manifestation of somebody that sort of ripped themselves apart and is trying to put themselves back together again. So it's fun when you can take a, a literal character, in this case, you know, a Tin Woodsman or Humpty Dumpty and break them all apart and then have part of the movie be about how he gets put back together again physically, which is what Luke is trying to do, what Han is doing in terms of his morality, but more importantly is what, in the end, what Darth Vader is trying to do. Luke is in the process of going into an extremely dangerous situation out of his compassion without the proper training, without the proper thought, without the proper foresight to figure out how he's going to get himself out of it. His impulses are right, but his methodology is wrong. And then on the other side, you have Lando in a situation where he's selling out his friends, he's selling out everybody in order to save his skin and to save his city, which is just the opposite. And then you've got Han Solo and everybody sort of in between those. It's the, caught in the middle of the whole mess. I also use the same thematic arc in this film as I did in the last film with Lando, which is that he, in the end, changes and becomes a more compassionate person, just like Han did, so that as they go along, they, their compassion you know, causes other people to become compassionate. He's seen the error of his ways and he's willing to sort of join them and do what he can to save them, even at risking his city and risking his life and everything else. But this is one of those examples of what I call recurring themes or, or reprises of particular themes it's like a musical thing where you take that note, which is the Han Solo character note from the last movie, and have him, in this case, Lando Clarissian, go through exactly the same emotional arc. Well, the idea in this scene is that they're torturing Han Solo in order to cause him pain, in order to give off the vibrations in the Force that allow Luke to sense that there's something wrong. It's not a matter of asking questions, it's a matter of getting him to suffer so that Luke will be attracted to the suffering and try to stop it. Part of the technical issues here is that the film has to end really between the confrontation between father and son. But just as with Obi-Wan Kenobi in the last film, I needed to have fewer cast members to deal with at the very end here. The interesting shading on these two stories between Han and Lando are that in the first film, Han switches over primarily for his caring and friendship of Luke and Leia. 
Whereas Lando, it becomes more of an imperative that realizing that by ignoring his responsibility, by making a pact with the devil, he's not going to win. It's going to get worse and worse and worse for him. The more he appeases Darth Vader, the more he joins and the more things he does, the worse his situation keeps getting. And so it's not necessarily out of his compassion for his friends, although some of that is in there. It's more about the fact that his situation keeps deteriorating and he realizes in the end that he's on a route that he can't get out of. It's his fate, so to speak. Uh, there's a certain aspect of fate that has been added into this in terms of having a compassionate lifestyle. In this case, that thematic device is used in the uh, New Hope uh, with Luke, which is his destiny is to go off and save the universe. And when he tries to not do it, I have to go home, I have to do bring the crops in, I have to do this. Well, the thing of it is, his surrogate parents end up getting killed. So all the reasons he's staying, everything is, you know, it keeps deteriorating to the point where he really doesn't have a choice. You know, you have a choice between sort of choosing evil and avoiding the issue, which you can't avoid. It will not be avoidable. Or taking the compassion route and taking the, the route of helping other people and not having to face this deteriorating situation of the more you get in, the worse it gets kind of thing. Kirsch, more than anything else, decided to use a more slightly abstract look to this set and use mostly steam, you know, because we were dealing here with this motif of hell in the middle of heaven, so to speak. So we wanted to make it kind of ethereal and lots of steam and smoke. So it creates a very almost abstract set and setting that is more steam than it is physical reality. I also wanted Lando to fully accept his role as being converted to the compassionate side. I didn't want Han to sort of force him or to, you know, I needed that as a device really to have Lando continue to help and become, I want to save his friend because he didn't expect that he was going to get encased in carbonite and all these things that were going to happen. At this point, Vader's plan really, now that he knows that he's his son, is to convince him to come with him and join the dark side and together they're going to overthrow the Emperor, which is the thematic device that is used through the whole movies in terms of Sith, which is if you have Sith Lords, there's usually no more than two because if there's three, then two of them will gang up on one of them to try to become the dominant Sith. Anakin would have been able to do it if he hadn't been debilitated, and now he's half machine and half man, so he's lost a lot of the power of the Force, and he's lost a lot of his ability to be more powerful than the Emperor. But Luke hasn't. Luke is Vader's hope. His motives at this point are purely evil. He simply wants to continue on what he was doing before, which is to get rid of the Emperor and make himself Emperor. He only sees his son as a mechanism to further that ambition. It's his mad lust for power. It's all these little subplots going on all the time of R2 picking up information from the city's computer that's going to help them later as they try to escape. And you know, there's lots of little setups for subplots that are moving through this whole thing that's built on bits and pieces of information. As opposed to a, a movie like American Graffiti where all the stories are not completely interwoven. They kind of are separate stories that are constantly, you know, cutting from one to another. This one, all the characters and all the little stories are all part of a bigger story, so they're all completely interwoven, which is much more complex in terms of trying to develop it all and make all the pieces fit together. It's a much more elaborate puzzle. I like this shot in particular. It's a big long lens shot. That curse did stacks everything up and it makes Vader look huge and look, look very small, very weak and Vader very powerful. And this is where you know, Vader reveals himself in terms of what his ambitions are, which is to have him join him to help overthrow the Emperor. It turned out to be a real collaborative endeavor between Kirsch and I. Him having a lot of freedom to direct the film the way he felt it should be in terms of the subtlety of the characters and the way he shot it and tried to support him. In this particular case of Star Wars, obviously I'm as the reigning expert on Star Wars and knew who everybody was, where everybody is and what happened and was able to solve any story problems because I'm also the only one that knew where the series was going. But there were things that were held off. I mean, the issue of Luke's father, I kept pretty quiet for a long, long time. I didn't tell anybody, not even Kirsch, because I just didn't want that to get out. And even when we shot it, we didn't give the actors that. I was very concerned 
about this ending, especially in terms of children and whether they'd be able to manage it. You know, he cuts his hand off, which is very symbolic. And what a young boy would think about this if he had to deal with it, and there's no resolution to it. But I talked to a number of psychologists who basically said that most kids, if it's too intense for them, will simply deny that it's true, that it, deny that he is his father, thinks he's just lying to him. And most of them said cutting the hand off wouldn't be a problem because he gets a new hand at the end. But those are the kind of things you consider when you're going through a story like this, especially since you know a lot of people are going to see it. What is the potential to you know, cause damage? It's not something you have to deal with if you have one film and it has a resolution at the end. But this one doesn't get resolved until the next movie, which in, when I made it, you know, wasn't going to come out for another three years. And more than anything else, that was my biggest concern about this ending, was that it really wasn't an ending. It was the bad guys win and the good guys limp home wounded. The films are designed for young people. They're designed for everybody, but these are really designed to be emotionally healthy, even though they have a lot of violence and that sort of things in them. The past has said that that isn't usually the issue for younger people. The issue is really how the violence is portrayed and the consequences of the violence and what it means in a cultural context, which is do the characters care about? Do they care about each other? Is there any respect for human life? And that's why most of the people that get shot in these movies are stormtroopers. You know, they're faceless. Most of mythology is pretty gruesome. Even most fairy tales are pretty gruesome. And so I'm pretty aware that human nature was to tell these stories and make them be very powerful in terms of their consequences. But now that we have sort of can take a, a more learned look at these things, it alerted me to the situation that without the ending of the movie, without the next ending, might be difficult for some kids. It's a unique situation of telling a story in three parts where you can't see them one right after the other. In those days, it was really, you know, you were going to see one movie, and then three years later, you are going to see the other movie. So if a kid saw it when he was nine, he wouldn't see the next one until he was 12. Left a lot of kids hanging. It's always one of those story challenges when you have the main character sort of realizing his true nature in the middle of an action scene where one part of it is his father who's on one ship and he's on the other ship. Yet they're kind of communicating with each other, and they're part of the obviously the issue here is what is Luke gonna, you know, where is he gonna end up? One of the issues in these movies is that R2 is the one who sort of comes through and saves the day. I mean, it's a subtle part of the story, but in the end, he's the one that always pulls them out of the danger, one way or the other. And then the payoff of this Darth Vader killing his subordinates. Piet joke is this one where he comes down at the very end of the movie and you fully expect him to get killed and he doesn't. He's too upset to even bother with killing his subordinates because you know, he's really, you know, we're talking about his son now. So he's conflicted. It's not just hate anymore. There's more to it than that. He's 3PO disassembled. I purposely made his new hand realistic looking, whereas you'll see when the same thing happens to his father in episode two, and his hand is not realistic looking. He wears a glove over it, but it's like a, just a metal hand, which is what gets cut off in episode six. But there is, again, this recurring theme of both Luke and his father have their right hand cut off.